Yeah. Okay. We're live now. Good afternoon. Sunday afternoon, uh, January 10th. Is it the 10th? Yep. Uh, I'm Kevin McKinney and Kevin Freeman is with us. And we're the guys that kind of got this York history group going on Facebook. And um, we're trying to pr promote and save and uh, uh, figure out what we're gonna do with all the history of York going forward. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we're also gonna bring a guest on after Kevin and I do a little bit of yakking back and forth. Uh, I've drawn up a little something. We got some do's and don'ts that we, we wanna talk about. Uh, we will never intentionally malign or put hurtful information out there. We hope we don't, we, we don't plan to put it out. If you think something needs to be deleted at any time, we have no argument. We will delete that. Um, we also will delete any off topic subjects. If, if somebody wants to put political rants or musings or opinion about a local happening or current events, uh, we're gonna delete it. Not because, not because of who you are. We're just, we're, we're just into history. That's all we're into. And uh, we 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 don't want to we don't care what your personal beliefs are. Um, we do not like to try and people to try and sell stuff on our on this as well. If you think you have something to add to any one of our topics, a history subject or whatever, please please put it in there, put it out there. Um, you don't know what you have that might answer questions for someone else. Our focus is strictly preserving the history of the town of York. Um, if you have questions, please ask them. Um, somebody asked a question last week, Veronica Hall. She put up a picture of her mother and a country western look like rock band. We're still working on it. We don't know where we're gonna go with it, but you never know where this is going until you ask the question. If, if we miss something, like I missed a message that somebody had sent me about a month ago that they had some pictures. And I was just going through my messages the other day and I totally uh, overshot that a month ago. So I'm, I apologize if I've missed your message. It wasn't intentional. We need, we wanna talk. We wanna put your stuff up. Uh, I'll back up just a little bit about my personal story, I put it on the on the uh, site the other day, but you know, whatever you have might ring a bell for somebody else, but I was in a Zoom meeting Wednesday night and uh, it wasn't my talk, turn to talk in the Zoom meeting. It happened to be on the Harbor Board situation. And I was scrolling through my iPhone and my messages and, and somebody sent me a message, one of our members, and we're now up over 650 members. One of my uh, members sent me a message with a couple of pictures. And the pictures were um, my father and my aunt that are over a hundred years old. And they were in his possession. And I was just flabbergasted. And come to find out who this, that, whatever. And yes, we are related. But my grandmother had sent some pictures of her two children 100 plus years ago to her baby sister who lived on Cider Hill. And now 100 years later, they surface in this person's holding. So you don't know what you have out there until you start digging around. And uh, so it was a wonderful, wonderful thing. I'll shorten this up if I can flip this page. Um, There are some upcoming events. We're gonna have a, a live on talk here with a genealogist. I don't know if Kevin scheduled that for maybe this Wednesday, that's gonna happen um, for people that are interested in genealogy. And at some point, hopefully within a week or 10 days, we're gonna interview an Ellis family member. I won't say who it is right now, but to talk about the Ellis family and the history in the town. And I will also mention affiliations that 
Kevin has started a Facebook page for York Genealogy, which will answer a lot of questions or it's a good format for beginners and Legends of Cape Nettick, which correlates with this York History Group. Well, that's my long winded start. So Kevin Freeman, you go ahead. All right. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Kevin, for all the enthusiasm that you have been putting into this group and all the great photos that you've been posting. And I think you just really excite the whole um, the whole group. And so thank you. And um, the genealogist uh, is uh, that I've been talking to is Kristen Lewis, and uh, she's going to join us right now. It's scheduled for January 27th at we think at 7 p.m., but that might change. Um, so if you have always been interested in gene doing your genealogy, and or even if uh, you do it or whatever um and you can just uh kevin and i are going to be kind of demonstrating what we do we're going to be sharing our screen i'm pretty sure and we'll be sharing how that we might approach it and kristen will also contribute so you might get some ideas and you might be able to teach us something um we also encourage people as we're live here if you do have questions um you can ask them on our Facebook page right now. I have an iPad that I'm monitoring to see if anybody's asking any questions. So um, please feel free to do that. And um, I kind of wanted to, like Kevin said, we're not interested in promoting businesses, um, but these these two books I um, I read currently, um, they're both by Neil Rold and they're both the same book actually. Um, they're, it's called York is Living History. And this is the first edition that he did and then um, he did the second edition, which has a more current chapter at the end. And I know a lot of people have been asking for what to read, like on this group and on Legends of Cape Medic um, in regards to York history. And this is a really good place to start, um, or this is a good place if, you, if you're not familiar with either of these, um, I recommend either of those. And I'd also like to say that, um, that history can be encompassing of a lot of things. And it's great um, if you can find family photos and memorabilia and share that with us. But if you do have some oral history that you'd like to share, if you'd like to write something, um, you can upload that here on your history group as a document. You can write it right in Word or whatever text uh, program that you use, save it, and then just upload it. And then we can all have the benefit of reading your written history. And the great thing about that is, is that you know it's more likely to be preserved. You're 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 writing history the way that you see it, and maybe someday somebody in future generations will read it and be really grateful that you did that. So I think that's it, Kevin. Um, I'm going to bring on our guest. Wait, uh, um, yeah? Yeah? Just one minute, if you could. Sure. Um, we're going to talk about how to move forward with this group when Kevin Freeman and I got together and, and we had not met until about a week ago personally, but um, we need some help from the audience, from our members on how we're gonna preserve this history. We don't know, we haven't figured that part of it out yet. We don't, the Facebook page was a start, but we wanna move something forward where if somebody has a picture, a couple of pictures, albums or something that we scan, we don't know. We don't know how we're moving forward, but we don't want the history of the town to get lost. And um, so that's a topic of conversation. I don't know if we're going to address it anymore tonight or not. Um, Franny, are we going to bring? Um, yeah. Can I introduce well, Franny? Well, wait a minute. So, yeah. So, Kevin, I almost skipped right over that. Um, so Kevin and I have realized that there is a vast resource of um, people's personal effects, especially photographs, and we could start offering to scan them for people and share them here on your history group. And we talked about um, getting a website and putting them there as a repository. And, and also, if you don't know, we have started a YouTube channel and it's got a few, it has the same title as the York History Group does. So if you go to YouTube and you type in York History Group, there's a few um, videos on there. I think the, the previous recordings of these Zoom meetings and I'm currently working with Ron Nowell on one um, of Mount Agamenicus, which was a presentation he gave at Old York Historical Society in 1975. Um, so we're trying to preserve what we are coming up with here. And um, so we're, we're wondering if, you know, we're, we're kind of just, Kevin and I have been talking about, you know, what if we get some sort of a small office space, if we, if we get a scanner, if we get 
if we get a way to facilitate this or if somebody wants to volunteer some time to maybe do some scanning and then you know if somebody does loan us their family photos to scan um, we need to return them um, so and then if but if they don't want to return them you know we're we're kind of just talking out loud about this if anybody does have any suggestions we definitely would welcome um, those suggestions yeah um uh our guest tonight is going to be my dearest friend, Fran, uh, Lord, uh, Fran Niles. Um, maiden name was Lord. And if I can give me two seconds now, yeah. Franny, a lot of people. Our guest tonight will be my dearest friend, Fran. Lord on that. Fran Niles. Fran needs to mute her other device. Um, Give us a nod when you've un when you've muted your other device, Fran. Me. Can anybody hear me now? I can hear you. I I have Franny muted. Here she's unmuted. Okay, yeah, let me unmuted. let me introduce Fran. If you don't know Fran, she grew up here in New York summers. She uh, grew up in Providence in the winter, but her her uh, mother was a Verrill. Um, very old name in York Harbor, and her uh, father was a lord from Kennebunk. So um, her family's been here well over 400 years or 300 and something years. Um, but just trying to introduce everybody to who we are and what we're doing. And uh, with that, Franny and I got involved with a research project with the Elizabeth Perkins House or the Perkins Family House here on Sewell's Bridge. And she's going to talk a little bit about that tonight and what she found out. And uh, thank you. Fran? Okay. Um, can everybody hear me and me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, like everyone here, I believe in sharing um, town history with everyone who's interested also. And um, I was thrilled when Kevin and Kevin invited me to be a part of this afternoon's discussion and uh, present some of my research on the Perkins family. Uh, at first, um, I thought right, of way, right away that most people would be interested in the town of York and what it was like for local residents as the onset of tourism swept into town. Um, Elizabeth Perkins and her mother, Mary, were the two that came from her family initially in like the 1898 or so, um, because they were related to uh, the Aldous family who were, uh, again, a, a wealthier and more prominent family um, of the summer colony. Um, but I'd like to start by saying a little bit about Elizabeth Perkins' family and um, what their importance to the town of York is. And then I'd like to double back and go over what um, life was like in York when um, tourism appeared, who the local residents were, what their livelihoods were, what their lives were like. And then a little bit about the people who came and how they all worked together, the locals and the summer people. Franny, can I just say that the Elizabeth Perkins house, the location is, um, it's on the it's South Seabury Road. Bridge, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you go down Seabury, if you go down Oregon Road, go over the York River is the red house on the right. And I'm going to put a picture of that on in a, in a minute while we're talking, just so people that aren't familiar with where it is will recognize it and know where it is. And, I, and I'll give you a little history of the house when you want, when you want me to pipe in. Okay, well, first let me start with the, um, the, the Perkins family themselves. Um, the father, J. Newton Perkins Jr., um, was from a wealthy and prominent New York City family. His father, uh, who was known as Joshua, that's where the J is, was uh, one of the leading people on the New York, the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. They were very wealthy. They did all the cultural and um, events 
they enjoyed what New York City had to offer in, in throughout the 1800s. Mary Sewell's, the mother, was from a prominent, um, more sort of intellectual, not so much business oriented family from St. Albans, Vermont. Her father was a uh, Supreme Court justice in the state of Vermont, not in the US, but in the state of Vermont. And uh, she was sent off to boarding school as was Elizabeth later, but um, they both were, they were both from very prominent families. Uh, they only had one child. Elizabeth was an only child and um, they made sure that she got to, they, that she got all the opportunities that a, a young wealthy woman of um, her stature would get in the um, in late 1880s. The, the parents had actually met in Nice, France on the Grand Tour, which was a sort of a de rigueur for um, society people of the time that they would tour around, um, they would tour, tour around Europe and even the Middle East and the further East like St. Petersburg. And um, Mary's mother surprisingly was at the um, coronation of the last czar of Russia and also went to Nicholas III's wedding. So um, they were in a different atmosphere than the rest of us. But they both they came here as guests of the Aldous family, um, who they were related to. And Aldous Lane. Aldous Lane down in the harbor was where the Aldous, excuse me, Aldous family, Asa Aldrich, um, Aldous built his um, summer cottage. And um, I think that to set the stage, we need to go back to the beginning of the 18th century. I mean, the 19th century, not the 18th, sorry. Um, and, um, and, no, and go over some of the details of what life was like 100 years before tourism came. Uh, Portsmouth, Kittery, the York, the whole seacoast area was experiencing a heyday of prosperity and economic in achievement thanks to the West India trade. Prosperity of the um, people involved in the trade like wealthy captains and shipbuilders um, accounted for them to be able to build glorious houses overlooking their own wharves in harbors, and um, this was especially true in Portsmouth. Um, but then uh, the Embargo Act of 1807 and the War of 1812 put a jarring halt to all the, econo the, all the complete economy of the whole Piscataqua area. Um, and the depression really went all the way into the mid 1800s. Uh, artists and um, authors that were local from like Portsmouth, South Berwick, Kittery, all wrote about how depressed and the decline of the area. One example is Thomas Bailey Aldrich, who described, quote, barnacles and eelgrass cling to the piles of the crumbling wharves the ghost of the old dead West India trade. It was really grim around here in, the, uh, in those times. Then um, by the mid 1800s, the industrial revolution was coming on and um, many towns, it, it enabled many towns to basically um, recreate, reinvent themselves. Um, there were mills, there was water power, there was lumber, there was textiles, and a thriving economy popped up on all the rivers. Um, other common livelihoods uh, associated were uh, running general, ship, general stores, farming, fishing, banking, all of those also recovered financially. And York itself had a thriving shipping business with wharves along the river, all the way from the harbor as far up as Scotland Bridge 
dedicated to trade in lumber, coal, textiles, and fish. Uh, by the 1800s, awareness of a new industry appeared throughout New England, and that was the tourism. Um, those who could afford it wanted to leave the steamy heat and filthy sort of summers in the city. Um, and the cities were primarily, the people primarily came here from Boston, New York. Amazingly, they came from as far away as Chicago, uh, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. Um, titans of business uh, politics, academia, medicine, and the art world researched the types of locations that they wanted to come to um, because there was um, quite, you know, tourism and the opportunity that it brought um, made it um, possible for them to really have a good choice. The decision they had to make was they gravitate towards inland lakes and the mountains, the fresh mountain air of New Hampshire, the rolling hills of Western Massachusetts or the seacoast of Maine and Rhode Island. Um, housing was a significant problem or consideration because few of the um, great turn of the century hotels had been built by the 1880s. Um, so seasonal vacationers were coming from the cities where they had running water, they had electricity, they had some paved roads, they had a lot. And they came to um, York and other seacoast areas. And uh, it, unless there was a hotel, they basically had to room with a local family whose homes lacked all those great facilities, the finer facilities that they had grown accustomed to. And this was a showstopper for a lot of those families. Um, but why York? Why, what set York apart from the surrounding towns? Why would people choose York? Um, it was endowed with all the desirable attributes that visitors were looking for, like fresh sea air, beautiful, gently sloping, hard, sandy beaches, well-sheltered well harbor, golf course, boats captained by locals who knew the waters and were eager to show off the seascape, and uh, even some cultural events. The atmosphere in York was special and very different from some of the other famous spots. Wealth was exaggerated in a very glitzy way in Newport, where many of New York City's industrialists came and built themselves mansions and even castles. Uh, the North Shore of Boston was more down to earth and communities like Nahant and Manchester by the sea attracted more the Beacon Hill Society, um, the S Beacon Hill Society families who were more academically oriented and professional men and, but they could be a little insular. They, you know, it's tough to break into that group. And York and Kittery seemed to get it just right. They had the blend of well-to-do families whose interests lay in business, politics, professions, arts, but the, um, here the focus was more on relaxation, culture and sporting activities. It was less on the high, high, high society things. Um, then it's important to think about who was here, who were the residents, what were their livelihoods, what were their lives like, who were the local people receiving all this group. Um, and some details are around 1880, 60% of the families were involved in fishing, 37% in farming. By 1900, the year round population of York was 2,600 people. And um, by then, a lot of the livelihoods had changed. At that point, only 4% of the families were exclusively fishing and 26% were farming but others had entered new businesses. Like the York Shore Water Company 
was incorporated, um, I think in 1895, by basically a who's who of prominent um, local patriarchs, Josiah J uh, Chase, John Varrell, Wilson Hawks, Hartley Mason, um, John Norwood and others. And they, they were the ones who um, built the gravity fed water system with various pumping stations along the way and even some hydrants uh, that brought water down from Chase's Pond. They, um, the telephone had arrived here in 1882. And then at that point, there were only six um, customers, but the, um, the, the person who ran the, bill, the um, phone company was Albert Bragdon, who took care of them in his spare time as he served as a clerk at Walk Walker's General Store in the village. Um, York's first newspaper appeared in 1891 under the name of the York Current. Uh, and it, um, it was based out of Charles Junkin's store and written by George Plaisted. Plaisted noted, and this is a good thing for us all to remember right now in these tumultuous times, Plaisted wrote, quote, letters of a vindictive nature will not be published. No black guardianism, no personal imputations without proof. We shall be alive and alert to the best interests of the public. Um, also in 1895, um, the electric service was provided by Agamenicus Light and Power, which was, had been started by Edward Marshall to provide electricity to the family hotel in York Harbor, the Marshall House. Uh, the generating plant was right on Woodbridge Road near the train station, which is just, um, uh, just at the end of, of Moulton Lane. And um, let's see, and John Bridges supplied ice for home ice boxes, dairy farmers, and the hospital for oxygen systems. Transportation was very difficult up to the 1880s in that the visitors who were coming from the East had to take a train first to Portsmouth, then switch to a ferry to cross the Piscataqua River to Kittery and then they continued by stagecoach to York. Uh, plans to improve this situation were, de were designed by four town fathers, Edward Marshall, John Staples, Henry Evans, and John Stewart. They, they made a proposal to the Eastern Railroad Company to extend a line from Portsmouth over to York. Uh, they were turned down by Eastern, and then they decided to make a go of it on their own. They had a $50,000 investment from Edward Marshall and Edward Talpy, who also sold Acme Farm Equipment and was the York Beach Postmaster and subsequently became owner of the Goldenrod. And there were several others too, but I like those two, along with help from the Boston and Maine Railroad. The York Harbor Beach and Railway Extension was founded and construction began. The route went through Kittery Point, Sea Point, Brave Boat Harbor, Seabury into York, into York Harbor, and on to the terminus at the Union Bluff Hotel in York Beach. And um, it was completed in 1887. We can still see, it's really fun to go either by boat or by car. We can still see the pilings, the old pilings of the railroad um, that span your uh, Brave Boat Harbor. Um, then, uh, hold on one second, in 1898, the Portsmouth, Kittery, and York Electric Railway, also known as the trolley, was um, initiated. And the PKY is known as the Pull, Kick, and Yank Trolley. Uh, they started carrying passengers between Badger's Island, Kittery Point, 
then they crossed not into York Harbor, but they went along Seabury, crossed at Sewell's Bridge, and they went to the uh, village first, then down to the harbor, and then over to the York Beach. And this was a big achievement because it made it possible fairly easily for local residents, summer residents, everybody to um, ha have public transportation between the small towns. Um, locals back then were proud of their old Yankee heritage. They knew what their ancestors had done for a living. They knew what houses they lived in. They knew who their ancestors' friends had been their roots were really strong and they worked hard to earn an honest living. Um, and they were determined not to be taken advantage of but, or condescended to by the newcomers um, who were of a different, different social class. But, you know, they were, they were proud of their heritage and they stood on solid footing. Uh, common family name, local names in the early 1900s, many of which date back to pre-revolutionary times include McIntyre, Barrel, Sewell, Moulton, Emerson, Blaisdell, Varrell, Sayward, Marshall, Bragdon, Donnell, and Weir. And I apologize to any people listening whose old family names I may have missed, but I couldn't like recite every single person. Um, the local community that received these visitors experienced a tremendous transformation when the summer visitors arrived. And, um, and the, the, the arrival of the summer visitors ballooned the population up as high as 12,000 people. Um, the vacationers swept into the town seeking a healthy, restrained community and quiet, with quiet spaces that would permit them to relax and uh, refresh. And while they were more successful financially and maybe more powerful in social stature, th they, this would have been potentially a recipe for a lot of clashing forces. But amazingly, this did not happen too much. Uh, both camps needed each other and sought to get along. They really, rec they really recognized, the, the local people recognized the robust commercial opportunity presented by the new people and a building boom took place. The stylish grand hotels like the Marshall House were built. Um, what had been former boarding houses were upgraded to being small hotels and inns like the uh, Emerson House, the Yorkshire Inn, the Harmon House, and um, you know there were others. The, the biggest building boom of all was led by the local um, architect E.B. Blaisdell and Arthur Bragdon was one of the main builders and um, the elegant summer cottages that would ultimately provide the visitors with um, their combination of privacy and entertainment were not yet built until you know it, into the beginning the first decade of the 20th century so um, what can I say about this now? The, by 1910, 20% of York's population was involved in some fashion in the building trade, which I thought was a high percentage of people. Um, and every local family, whether shopkeeper, farmer, fisherman, wharf owner, banker, carpenter, they all welcomed the prospects. Um, but they were not giving up their self-esteem and self-respect. Uh, they took pride in their work and were not going to be ordered around. The, um, the summer people uh, cooperated by 
doing a lot of shopping at all the local stores, the food, the hardware supplies, coal. Um, I emphasize that a little because my family was in the wharf business and the general store business, the Varrell store in, uh, in York Harbor. Um, and, um, you know, there were ups and downs, but for the most part, throughout the 20th century, issues be were resolved respectfully and residents and summer people love York and worked together to make York the success that it is. Um, benefits were on a two-way street and, you know, there were growing pains, but we all got through it. And finally, I guess, let me wrap up by saying that there was, um, you know, a possibility for, there was been many possibilities for a conflict um, in interactions between the wealthy advantage or advantage visitors from away and the townspeople. But, you know, it, it's all worked, it's all worked well. And, um, and here we all are. And finally, I will say um, just a couple of places that the, that, um, that we want to remember that the Perkins, both um, Mary Perkins and her, uh, the mother and Elizabeth Perkins uh, propelled into um, preserving because they're very important places around town. And that would include the jail, the Jeffords Tavern, the Snowshoe Rock, uh, the Donnell Hancock Wharf, the, let's see, what else? There's so many the places. The cemetery. The cemetery. Maud Muller yeah. Spring. Huh? Maud Muller Spring. The Maud Muller Spring. And what? Well, and yeah, there's just so many things that they did, but it's, but I wanted first, I hope that you'll invite me again and I'll talk more about the family themselves, but I really thought that it would interest people in who are listening now to understand what the atmosphere was for these two um, societies that came together. Nice. So Excellent. For, thank you for inviting me. I think that was um, accurate. I guess it, if we're talking about Elizabeth Perkins, we should, you know, they started out when I'm doing, when I'm reading old newspapers and stuff, they started out as the York Improvement Society. Correct. And they wanted to, they wanted to, you know, they, the old cemetery, the ancient cemetery, the one on the Lindsay Road side was a mess and they cleaned out a lot up and they, cleaned up the old jail and they were just looking to improve and and uh, and make everything look tidier. And I guess it's what, and it blossom into what today is old York. Um, I will mention that when I was researching the project, the Perkins house now, as we know it today, was actually a local's house up until about 18, 89, I think something like that. Mm -hmm. The last local family that owned it was, hello? Am I still on? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't have you on my screen, I don't know why. But anyways, the last local family that owned it was the Sewell family. And actually a couple of our members, or several of our members, uh, their grandfather was born in that house. It passed from the Sewell family to Huda Cooper, Frank, I think his name was Frank Huda Cooper. And Frank was a wealthy Philadelphian. And he also had bought the Stedman, what we know today as the Stedman Woods, that field over there. He owned both properties, but he had contracted malaria and was a very sickly man in his early thirties. And uh, he actually died soon after he had sold the Perkins house, the, uh, his property, the Huda Cooper house, to the Perkins uh, family, um, Jay Newton and his wife, Mary, uh, Elizabeth's parents. So the, uh, the Perkins house was a, was a local's house for a long time. Um, 
I just wanted to mention that. Uh, you find early references to Stedman Woods being called Huda Cooper Field. That was actually the big uh, local area where they had uh, events like uh, Boy Scout jamborees or something. They would have tent outs there on Huda Cooper Field. I've, I've heard that mentioned. And it took me the longest time to find out about Paul's Hill. Now, if anybody has read anything or ever heard of Paul's Hill, when you walk out into Stedman Woods, if you go over the Wiggly Bridge, you can take a left and go to the shore. You can take the right and go up behind the barn. You actually climb a hill, and that is called Paul's Hill. And uh, that's where um, Edward Moody would bring the cannon out, the famous Palo Alto cannon, and he would, 4th of July, and of course there were no trees back there then, and he would let the cannon sound and, and uh, you know, 4th of July. So I just wanted to bring that up. If, if, uh, we're talking about Elizabeth Perkins House, Buddha Cooper, and the history with the locals involved. I mean, that's all I can really add to it at this. I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Yeah, we've done good time-wise. I, I would like to say that we did build this as a discussion on Elizabeth Perkins. And so, Frank, I think you've laid down the perfect foundation for the continued conversation um, in the future. And well, and and the reason that I was excited to have you on, Franny, was was because of all the research that you've done specifically on Elizabeth Perkins. She has done um, a research paper, I would say, a 10 part um, paper, um, which details a lot of uh, Elizabeth's life from her parents um, until her demise. So we will have you back and that's, uh, and thank you very much. Um, it was really informative, I had a great time. And uh, if I could bounce back to um, one of the other, the main topic, the other topic we were wanted to bring up today is we need audience membership input as to how we're gonna go forward, um, how we're gonna save and preserve this history. Um, we don't know, we, we want suggestions, we want, we, we, we haven't figured it out. And um, one of the biggest problems, uh, people have these pictures and things and this stuff and, and, and uh, they say, I've got this stuff that came down through my grandmother and blah, 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 blah. Case in point, somebody dropped five albums off here the other day. I went through them because I'm into it. And uh, it was uh, great stuff some background scenery, mostly people, but the biggest problem was nobody had wrote anything in. So now the family, three or four generations, don't know who these people are. And it really doesn't, going forward, what's it gonna do for anybody? So if you have albums, you have family photos, you know something about them, or you wanna know more about them, you know, we'll get involved with that. But at the same time, if you know something about them, write on them and, and put down and who this was and what this is, because you're going to have the big one and somebody's <laughs> going to inherit these pictures and they're going to say, who is that guy with the beard, with the beer in his hand? Wait a minute. Come on. Yeah, that, so that's, that's, uh, yeah. that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to preserve that stuff. That's for sure. And, yeah. um, and I also noticed right now we have a lot of people um, uh, viewing us on Facebook. So a shout out to everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. And thank you for uh, joining our membership. Uh, uh, we can't, don't, we don't come on and say thank you every time somebody joins, but we, we do appreciate you joining. We want your input. And uh, there's some really great history that we're, and we're learning from this. That's the biggest thing. This is a learning experience. We're learning. Uh, I didn't know this or that or who did what and what and now it makes it all a lot clearer so thank you for that we yeah. appreciate it all right so th thanks again Freddie. we're going to sign off everybody have a great evening and we'll catch you next time okay thank you okay. bye good